Uh, my name is Brendan Teeling. I'm the founder and director of the festival. Our speakers today are Katja Hoye and Roger Morehouse. Katja is a German-British historian specializing in modern German history. She was born in East Germany and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in London and is one of the presenters of the Tommy's and Jerry's uh, podcast, uh, highly recommended. Roger Morehouse is a great uh, supporter of our festival, delighted to have him back. Roger began his writing career working for Professor Norman Davis and has since written several highly successful books on aspects of the Third Reich. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Katya and Roger. Roger, enjoy the evening. Thank you, Brendan. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be uh, back uh, with you at the, uh, the Dublin Festival of History. Um, just my only regret, of course, is that we're not actually in Dublin to enjoy it in person, but uh, we're doing it via Zoom. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a great pleasure to be back with you. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, interviewing uh, Katia Hoyer this evening. I'm going to pass straight on over to her because she is going to give us a, a short presentation uh, for about 20 minutes. After that, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A between us, and then we'll open the floor to questions from from. Uh, uh, the audience. So I will hand swiftly over to Katya. The floor is yours, Katya. Thank you, Roger. Um, I thought I'd give everyone a quick whistle stop tour uh, through the origins of the German nation state. I, I wrote this book this year in, um, well, I wanted to publish this year because it is 150 years after the foundation of the first German nation state. Uh, in 1871 and, and there was very, very little fanfare or celebration and perhaps that wasn't expected really in, in Germany given its, its troubled history. But I found it remarkable and, you know, kind of in the build up to that expected it to be very, very low key and there was indeed very little by way of even, um, you know, a conversation really to be had in a, on, a, on a national scale in Germany. Uh, and so hopefully this book has sort of at least given it a little bit of a um, starting point, or that was the idea in any case. Um, so if we go back um, quite a long way, really, before um, 1815, um, it's quite remarkable that Germany just didn't exist, not even as an idea uh, to start with. So some people were already starting to talk of uh, sort of the German tongue, meaning the language. Um, in, the, in the sort of late 18th um, and early 19th century, but it wasn't really a concept for many uh, people at all. And you just had this patchwork of little uh, states and principalities, over 400 of them, that collectively made up, made up the, uh, what is sometimes referred to, referred to as the First Empire or the uh, Holy Roman uh, Empire. And ironically, um, it was a Frenchman um, who helped come along and, and sort of sort this out at least a little bit. Uh, namely Napoleon, uh, and when he invaded um, the, the German lands, playing really all of the German states off against each other one way or another, um, conquering them and uh, bribing some of them, uh, making, making financial deals and otherwise basically to try and, um, and you know, sort of conquer the, the, this patchwork of German states. Uh, he realized pretty quickly that in order to control the lands that he just conquered, he needed to unify it just a little bit. And so he turned this patchwork of over 400 uh, states and principalities into just 39. Um, and those stayed basically after the Napoleonic um, invasion. So really uh, the great irony of, as you see, is the pattern really throughout the 19th century of the German unification process is that it's in, in large parts driven by the French, uh, whether willingly or unwillingly is a, diff is a different matter, but that's uh, certainly a huge factor in this. Um, so when uh, Napoleon first invaded, um, uh, the Prussian response was pretty sluggish. So despite the fact that when you sort of look at the, at the Kingdom of Prussia up here, it's, it's already a very sizable uh, German state. Uh, their king, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm III, uh, is fairly reluctant to do anything about it. Um, and initially he had a very sort of weak response. His wife then, Louise, luckily, uh, picked up the war party in the, in the country, um, or in the, in the kingdom, um, and was beginning to organize a little bit of uh, resistance against that. And eventually uh, her husband had to do something. Um, it's interesting as well that Louise, actually, his wife turned into a, into a bit of a um, hero figure in, in German history because of that. Um, and she's quite often um, yeah, more famous, really, in, in German culture and historical memory than, than her husband was. Um, and this is also at the time when the German colors are born. So this fighting back against Napoleon is known as the Liberation Wars. Um, and Friedrich Wilhelm uh, raised troops um, from volunteer groups, really. So he, he basically appealed to his people in 1813 
um, not really sure at this point how to address his people. He wants to say fellow Germans because he wants everyone basically to fight against Napoleon, but knows full well that that, that isn't a concept that people would have recognized. And so he calls on his fellow Prussians um, and, and various different other people basically addressing them directly by the state uh, that they're affiliated with and says, we all need to now rally together. And it's that volunteer myth kind of people rallying for the fatherland, as it were, for the first time, for some sort of notion of Germanness uh, that gives Germany its, its first impetus as a nation state. The most famous uh, volunteer group, uh, or Fry called uh, group at the time, were the Lützow volunteers, and their colours would eventually turn into the German colours. So you've basically got the black of their coats, um, the gold of their brass buttons, um, and the red of the, of the lining forming later the, the German colours. Um, or at least that's how legend sort of later presented it um, due to their sort of fighting spirit and, and the voluntary nature of their fighting because they weren't conscripted uh, but volunteered to fight for, uh, for some sort of form of Germanness. Um, and then after uh, 1815, once Napoleon was defeated, those 39 states that he'd uh, created to try and control uh, the German lands stayed. Um, and were sort of cemented um, at Vienna, at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And that's a huge turning point in, in German national history, as much as it is in European history. I always find it interesting that 1815 is more remembered, of course, in, in Britain for, for Waterloo and for the defeat of Napoleon, uh, whilst for Germany, it really is a, is a sort of moment of, of national formation, really, in terms of uh, pushing a nation of Germany forward and also you know, narrowing down those over 400 of the states into just 39. Sorry, um, Katja, just yeah. to interrupt, I've, I've got nothing on my screen. I wonder if oh, um, if you can just go, try and flick it back and forward again. Yeah, let me try. Sorry. Does it not work? Is it working now? That's, I've got a map now. With, yeah, uh, that's the yeah. one, yeah. yeah. Lovely, 1815. Thanks. Great, yeah, that's the one, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, in 1815, the other big turning point is that Prussia gains a huge amount of land here in the Rhineland uh, or in the Ruhr, and it's interesting that this was basically approved by uh, Britain, one of, one of, of course, the, the victors of, of 1815, because the idea was that Prussia would take over sort of duties here against the, the pesky Belgians who had been annoying everybody. Uh, Austria had previously done this, um, but wanted to take a step back from this um, simply because it's too far away for them. And so this was simply handed to Prussia when Prussia was asking for it. Um, as a sort of, you know, okay, then you have to deal with this sort of thing. And people didn't really appreciate the fact that this is full of coal, iron ore, and, and all the other ingredients that you need to kickstart an industrial uh, revolution in, in the German lands, which had previously been very sluggish. And so handing this over to Prussia basically gave Prussia a huge head start over all of the other German states, including Austria, which had actually still been seen as, a, as the superior of the two German states. Um, and so what happens is they form a very, very loose uh, confederation, German confederation in 1815. Uh, it's more of an economic um, kind of market sort of type situation. The only thing that binds them together really is, is a kind of common interest in, in trading with one another, making that a little bit easier. Um, and in theory, they have to go to war together um, if they get attacked. Uh, that is problematic um, later that doesn't always work, but that's the idea. But it isn't by any stretch of the imagination a nation state either. It's still 39 individual states with their kingdoms um, and their, uh, well, with their kings and their dukes and so on still in place. Um, the next big turning point is 1848. Roger, is that on the screen now? The, yep, the, the that's track? fine. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so at this point, uh, people, the, the Industrial Revolution had really kicked in at this point, um, and there were all of the intendant sort of social problems with it um, in terms of living together in cramped conditions in the cities, uh, various different problems with the harvest in the 1840s, and people were hugely unhappy. This isn't a German thing, so you have the uh, same sort of type revolution everywhere in Europe, and, and they're really quite widespread. Um, but in Germany, it for the first time also turns into a national um, thing whereby people are going out there again with the same colours, with the German tricolor, waving the flag. Uh, the German anthem is, is invented that we still use now, although we only sing the third stanza of it now for <laughs> various different reasons, uh, because it later got used by, um, by the Nazis and corrupted. The lyrics were later corrupted by the Nazis. Um, so this idea of, of Germany, Germany above everything in the first line of it, 
here in this context in 1848 meant the German idea is higher and more important to people than their religious uh, denomination or their state that they live in or their regional loyalty. And that was the original idea of it. Later, of course, it takes on a more sinister meaning and um, that, that part of the G German anthem isn't sung anymore. It's just a third uh, stanza, or at least in, in normal circles. <laughs> Um, so in, in 1848, for the first time, people go out, they want a German nation state, they want Germany to be unified, or at least certain segments of the German population do, partially to try and curtail the power of the, of the sort of ancien regime of the old elites, because the idea is once you have a German nation state with a constitution, the monarchs will have to stick to that as well and become part of, of a, a sort of legal concept that's bigger than them, and it ties them into that. And that gets brutally crushed uh, by the um, nobility in Germany, this uprising, um, everywhere across Germany, pretty much. Bismarck's right at the front of it, we get to him in a minute, but he's basically already, um, at this point, a politician in, in Parliament in Prussia, um, and is right at the front of, you know, no, this needs to be squashed, um, and then we'll deal with it afterwards. Um, so speaking of the man, um, that's Bismarck there on the on the screen at the uh, time of um, when he became basically Prussian prime minister. Um, I've lost I've lost it again, Katya. Oh, sorry. I, I, I hope that um, yeah, that's they've got it now. Okay. That's fine. Could you could you shuffle a bit close to your microphone as as well? There are a couple of comments there that they're yep, struggling to hear. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Um, so the. Uh, yeah, time when Bismarck became prime minister. So this this we're now talking um, 1862, when basically uh, there had already been this liberal movement I was just talking about in 1848, and the liberals hadn't gone away. So they're still arguing for a nation state, still arguing for a constitution to tie the monarchs down. Um, and the kings, or certainly the Prussian king, is struggling more and more with this uh, problem in, in his own um, state in Prussia. Bismarck at this point had previously actually been sent away out of Prussia because the new Prussian king, uh, Frederick Wilhelm the, the, uh, IV, and then also his brother, once he takes over Wilhelm the, uh, I, who will also later become the first German Kaiser, were all a little bit frightened of this really brash, ultra-conservative, uh, very aggressive politician in parliament. And so he was sent out uh, first to Russia uh, as ambassador uh, and then to France as ambassador. Uh, to try and sort of give him something to do, keep him busy, but also keep him out of Berlin, where he's constantly scheming and, and like I said, doing very sort of aggressive uh, backstabbing politics there, which uh, the king was a little bit frightened of. Um, but the problem is that once those liberals are proper established in the Prussian parliament um, and form a larger and larger faction, they are wanting uh, reforms to be put in place. Um, and particularly military reforms that the, that the king is doing, um, they're trying to block those. So the idea was that the king basically wanted those volunteer units I was talking about earlier, who had still been a, a sort of uh, leftover relic of the liberation wars gone because they're loyal to a concept of Germany, not necessarily to the Prussian king. And trying to reform that, the liberals weren't happy with that. They'd just seen what happened in 1848. And if the king gets a, an army that's entirely loyal just to the king, um, there will never be any change, basically. They thought they'd just be constantly oppressed. Um, and at that point, Bismarck gets called back from uh, France uh, to try and help the king basically push through those military reforms. And Willem I had been so um, depressed by this whole process that he actually broke down in tears um, and said, no, I just need to give up the throne. I need to abdicate. I don't know what to do. Parliament are constantly hostile. I can't get any legislation through it. Um, and so basically Bismarck is called back quickly to try and restore the uh, or rescue really the monarchy in, in Germany. Um, and it's in that context uh, that he's appointed prime minister of Prussia, steps straight in front of parliament and says these famous words that are also the title of my book, uh, not through speeches and majority decisions for the great questions of the day be decided, but by iron and blood. Meaning stop squabbling, stop arguing, we're going to build that army whether you like it or not, um, and politics now get made by iron and blood, uh, mainly brute force basically. And he actually just pushes through these army reforms that the king had been struggling with to the point of despair by just running an illegal budget. Um, so he's simply putting this in place um, and changing the military, putting more money into it, taking the volunteer units out completely illegally against parliamentary, uh, against the parliamentary will. 
and he only rectifies that later once Germany is created uh, by basically backdating the whole process and, and saying to Parliament, can you approve this now in retrospect? Um, and you already get a sense for his politics from that. You know, that's how he basically runs the country later as well. What Bismarck wants to happen, happens. And then he needs to somehow find a way of getting Parliament on side. Um, so he actually follows up on this whole idea of uh, blood and iron. Um, hopefully there's a picture on the screen now there with uh, Napoleon. I'm blank, I'm blank again, catch it. Again. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know why this keeps happening. No, it's back now. That's it. Perfect. Um, so uh, what he does is he basically instigates a series of wars that are not, they are now known as uh, the, uh, as the sorry, uh, unification wars, German unification wars uh, against Denmark and Austria and then France uh, in, in rapid succession. And this is the last one of them, basically, with Napoleon III, um, the, the French king, uh, sat there basically after he'd been captured in 1870. Uh, by the um, by the German troops um, and in the franco prussian war basically they'd all been fighting together against Napoleon III. It did also help Bismarck that this is another Napoleon. <laughs> so when this war was instigated and Napoleon III declared war, all he had to do is go back to the German people and say, look, this is just like 1815 or 1813 when the, when the liberation war started. Uh, it's another French attack on German soil. We need to fight together. And this is what rallies all of those uh, 39 states together, basically, despite all of their animosities amongst each other. And that's the remarkable thing, basically, that Bismarck does, is he bridges all of the differences that the German states have, including things like religion. So the Catholic states in the South are hugely opposed initially against the Protestant dominance in the North. And none of that matters when this foreign enemy attacks and Bismarck kind of uses the, the nationalism that results from that to unify the country. Um, is that on the screen now, Willem? That is. First? Yeah. yeah, great. So the, the interesting last bit that I just want to raise quickly is that when Germany is unified um, in 1871 on the back of the Franco-Prussian Wars, uh, in, in that sort of afterglow of, of nationalism, the one figure that is hugely opposed to the idea of it is the Prussian king. Willem the first uh, is by no means so the, the way it's sometimes depicted as a sort of Prussian project to take over Germany that's partially true because that's what Bismarck wants but the Prussian king hates the idea breaks down in tears the day before uh, the the proclamation of the German Reich in at the beginning in January uh, January the 18th of, of 1871 and says to Bismarck we're carrying Prussia to the grave and this is all your fault you're abolishing Prussia he is so obsessed with the idea of giving up his Prussian crown or melting it in, so to speak, to make a, a German one, uh, that he's on the brink of despair on the night before Germany is declared as a state. And Bismarck, the only way that Bismarck can convince him that that is a good idea is to say to him, look, this is going to make Prussia stronger. You don't worry about this at all. You just sit in your Prussian palaces, get on with your life, just keep on you know, doing what you do, hunting parties and so on. I'll run the country for you. And that's effectively what happens for the next 20 years. Bismarck just takes over effectively as, as the first German chancellor and runs the country on behalf of, of Wilhelm. They do clash occasionally over policy, for instance, what to do with the socialists. Um, but on the whole, um, it's basically Bismarck's uh, thing. And that really only changes, if I just skip forward uh, to um, the free Kaiser year quickly. So in 1888, the, the old Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm I dies. Um, very briefly is succeeded by his son, uh, Friedrich III, who is very liberal, married to uh, Vicky, Queen Victoria's oldest daughter, and they were going to run it in a sort of English style uh, constitutional monarchy, but he died uh, in the same year of uh, throat cancer, couldn't actually speak throughout his entire uh, short reign uh, because he'd already been so ill, and then basically Kaiser Wilhelm I's grandson, Wilhelm II, takes over. Bismarck initially imagines that he's going to continue to run the country um, simply because uh, Wilhelm is still a very young man at this, at this point um, and had actually been sort of mentored and raised to some extent by Bismarck. Um, but that quickly doesn't work out. And over the next two years from 1888 to 1890, uh, the two simply fall out with each other and Bismarck has to go, at which point uh, Wilhelm takes over. I like this quote, maybe we we'll just finish on this one. Um, so the, the, he said basically about Wilhelm, uh, the Kaiser is like a balloon, you have to hold tight to the string because you never know uh, where he'll be off to next. And that's sort of how Bismarck felt about it. And he's very, very bitter in, his last, in the last years of his, of his life. He died in, in 1898 um, when he saw all of his sort of work of integrating Germany into Europe disintegrate um, under the sort of very aggressive foreign policy stance that uh, Wilhelm is, is introducing.
Okay, I think I'll finish there so that we have enough time for our conversation. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Katja, for that um, uh, elegant gallop through, uh, well, all of, all of 19th century uh, German history, effectively. Um, just picking up on that last point with Bismarck and uh, Wilhelm II. I mean, they are the two, they are the two dominant figures in the, the history of the Second Reich of the German Empire. Is it fair to say, in a sort of kind of, I'm just throwing it out as a sort of simplistic thing, like, almost like an essay question. Is it fair to say you've got 20 years of Bismarck as a creator and you've got 20 years of, of Wilhelm as a destroyer? Is that sort of a fair typology? That's certainly how it has been presented. I think there's certainly a case for Bismarck being the creator because he was so cautious and conscious of the idea of Germany being a new construct in Europe. Overnight, it's the largest European state just created overnight. So in terms mm. of population, in terms of space, in terms of economic power, it very, very quickly becomes uh, the dominating European force. And he knows that that's not going to go down well with the French um, who just been defeated in battle. So he needs to make sure that the French are isolated because he knows he can't win them over. But he does win over Russia and Britain um, by making a very, very cautious type of foreign policy, basically spinning this really complex network of alliances very well. Uh, there it comes in handy that he was the ambassador to, to France and Russia before he knows pretty much everyone who is anyone in Europe uh, personally and knows how to play these different figures diplomatically and, and does it very well. And by the time that he goes, there's this famous punch cartoon, Dropping the Pilot, where basically Bismarck sort of steps off the German ship. And it's, it's a British cartoon, and you can see just how anxious, you know, Britain is from that. The pilot's yeah. leaving the ship. Who's steering it now? This young and experienced Kaiser. And in that same cartoon, um, Willem sort of leans over the railing, you know, very confidently and in, in, in a sort of brash you know, manner saying goodbye to Bismarck and, and this sort of cocky young Kaiser is taking over. But I think in fairness to Willem, it's probably not a good sentence starter, is it? <laughs> but um, <laughs> in fairness to uh, Wilhelm, he does inherit an incredibly complex network that Bismarck had set up to make himself indispensable. And he had been indispensable at that point, or up to yeah. that point. And so when anybody else takes this over, it's just a mess. You know, you don't know who he's been talking to, what secret letters he sent to who. One example is this Russian reinsurance treaty that he'd made with, with Russia whereby basically they promised each other not to attack each other. Uh, but Bismarck made sure that Austria didn't know about it because Austria and Russia were drifting further and further apart. And so he had to keep it a secret knowing full well that court gossip would get around very quickly. So he hadn't told anyone really about this. And when Willem takes over, Willem doesn't know about it. Uh, his new chancellor Caprivi doesn't know about it. Um, and it's just there and it just lapses. Um, so that's often presented as a conscious decision, but Bismarck kind of just kept that to himself because he didn't want Austria to find out and then it's just there. So I think in many ways, Willem is struggling uh, in a situation that was difficult to run for anyone who wasn't Bismarck. Yeah. And even Bismarck himself was, was struggling with the drifting um, interests of all of the different kind of parties that he had to keep together. So yeah. I'm not entirely sure whether if Bismarck had been a younger man, then it ruled for another 20 years, whether he would have really been able to avoid the calamities that, that followed. And, and in those calamities that followed, um, how much do you think, uh, as is, you know, it's usually kind of described in this way, how much do you think the sort of the personality of Wilhelm II is influential in the, in the resulting politics and the resulting calamity? I think it is very important because he has this obsession with Britain. So as I was mm. just mentioning, his his father, Willem the, uh, sorry, Willem, Friedrich the Third, um, was married to Vicky. So he had an English mother um, and his grandmother was Queen Victoria. He was mm. her oldest grandson. So he spent an awful lot of time as a child in Osborne, sitting on you know the top of Osborne Palace, w watching the ships go in and out um, of the Solent um, and just being absolutely in awe of the British Navy. He was so obsessed with it, you know, different uniforms that he inherited. He was made an admiral um, of the British Navy as well. Um, and I think that aspect certainly plays into the plot and politic, this idea of building up a German Navy uh, more quickly than was perhaps wise. So Bismarck was always super cautious not to uh, put Germany out there as an ambitious uh, kind of empire building nation. Um, he'd always made it very clear that Germany is a continental power, a counterpole to France that reassured Britain as well um, and that worked but Wilhelm just can't let go of this idea of Germany being a naval power as well he was obsessed with this book uh, by Alfred Thayer Mahan who was a, an American 
naval captain. Um, the, the power of, of sea power basically was described in this book. And Bismarck, that was, sorry, Willem, that was his Bible, basically. He read that inside and out. He had it translated and then given out to all of the um, kind of naval staff in, in Germany as a German translation. And, and the idea in this book that's being put forward is that you cannot be a world power without having a, a strong navy. And mm. that's sinking in into Willem's mind to a point where he certainly pushes that. But he's not alone with that. The obsession is there across the world, really, and especially in Germany as well, amongst the uh, new and old elites, really. So everyone's pushing for an empire. Everyone's pushing for a naval building program. And the moment you do that, if you think about the way that if Germany goes out of Europe to go anywhere, the ships are sailing through the channel, or straight past yeah. over, basically. You can physically yeah. see the German naval might being built up. And that um, is something that, in the end, of course, caused a lot of diplomatic problems. Do you, do you see Wilhelm as being entirely, I would say, entirely sane, but entirely stable mentally? He's not, is he? No, I don't think anyone does, <laughs> no. to be fair. Uh, but how, much, at... how much do you think that influences the politics as well? Because he, he is, I mean, he's, he has this uh, sort of quasi-democratic system beneath him, but he's still yeah. effectively ruling uh, ruling Germany as a as an emperor. So that, that must have an effect, right? Yeah, people were joking about the fact that he's always uh, sort of dragging a little bit of medievalism with him wherever mm. he goes, because he had this idea of kind of, you know, court, very old fashioned idea of what the court should be like. He actually openly said he wanted to abolish the the office of the of the of uh, the chancellor completely, so that there's no uh, middleman between him and the people anymore. Um, called the German Parliament an ape house, um, mm -hmm. so because <laughs> not least because there had been a new ape house being built in Berlin Zoo uh, with a sort of glass dome on top, and in yeah. his mind that mirrored the the newly built Reichstag basically because they were nearly finished at the same time with the squabbling and all of the shrieking, yeah. as he called it, yeah. underneath it. Um, but yeah, certainly an element of that, um, un basically being unstable. And his problem is that he's completely without guidance. I mean, he's a relatively young Kaiser, mentally a little bit uh, fragile in any case uh, due to his upbringing. So he had this disability when um, from birth, uh, his, his left arm was withered and, and he couldn't use it. So that is something that psychologically sunk in with him. And he just had to constantly prove himself um seeing like i said yeah this old old notion of kingship almost the, the the kaiser represents the country and if you have a disability that will reflect on germany in his mind and so he had to make up for that yeah but i think on top of that the fact that he was completely without a mentor he'd got rid of bismarck and then of course bismarck died in any case at, at the end of the century and um, then he had this group that they're known as the Liebenberg Circle. They were basically a group of, of very close advisors to him uh, who he had person, personal friendships with. But when that circle broke apart, because there was basically a, a, a legal case around one of the members, one of the leading members being a, a homosexual, which was, of course, still a, a crime at the time, and that was dragged through the courts, Bismarck had, sorry, Willem had to, dis had to distance himself from the circle and take, take a step back meaning he lost that whole group of people that, that he sort of turned to and that left him nowhere to go other than the court where the militaries were basically waiting for mm. the military elite. And that's where Moltke and, and, and people like Helmut von Moltke and people like that are basically sitting there constantly pushing the um, build-up of naval and, and armed forces. Um, and that's the only people he's surrounded with. Uh, just let me wind you back to 1888. Um, the year of three emperors and um, a counterfactual question. I personally, you know, counterfactual questions are sometimes quite fun. They're sometimes misleading, but they're a nice parlor game to play. Um, but I want to ask, you know, counterfactual, had Frederick III not died of cancer within however many months of his accession, uh, and had he been able to rule, um, might German history you know, all of the stuff we know from the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, might German history have gone in a different direction? Your thoughts? Yeah, it is a, is a huge what if, isn't it? And it's one of the most intriguing, I find, as well, of German history, because it's right at the origin um, yeah. and, and where things kind of hadn't gone <laughs> wrong yet. Um, so in, in many ways, um, it is an intriguing question to ask because they had this ambition. So Vicky herself, uh, his wife, it was incredibly ambitious and intelligent and had taken a lot of political advice from her mother being her oldest daughter as well. And Victoria at that point, so Queen Victoria, um, her mother had um, you know, grown in confidence in England, kind of taking a little bit um, in terms of the politics over herself, certainly keeping a keen eye on it. Um, and had given that political interest to her daughter, to her oldest child um, as well. And so there is certainly the ambition there from Vicky's side. I mean, Fritz, or, you know, she called him Fritz Friedrich, um, her husband was a little bit um, 
that he was supposed to be have been very handsome but a little bit sort of um bland uh a bit, dull. bit of a, yeah <laughs> dull <laughs> to some extent even very nice man by all accounts but not very sort of you know he didn't push back when he was pushed basically yeah. so i think there was always this idea at court that if those two run the country together it would have been run by vicky and I think that's what would have caused problems because there's this idea of, you know, the sort of not only a foreign person coming in and running the country, but also a woman. Um, she, by all accounts, proper got on the nerves of everyone at court because she'd constantly kind of be there and, and put her kind of strong opinions out there in, in discussion. And of course, Germany was still Germany at the time, very, yeah. very conservative. You know, this wasn't the court in Britain where you could probably at this point sort of begin to get away with that sort of thing. Uh, but you couldn't in Germany. People constantly described her as an absolute nuisance and, and got annoyed with her. Um, so I think if she tried to do kind of, you know, run the country through Frederick, I think there would have been some form of pushback at court, okay. um, especially as the, the court elites on the whole is the conservative faction was still much, much bigger than the liberal faction yeah. at court. Um, so I think they would have eventually been undermined in their, in their rule, certainly hemmed in. Um, and as you say, there's still parliament there, there's still uh, the Bundesrat is the upper house, um, and that was entirely still dominated by the um, old elites because Bismarck had put a three-tier voting system in place in Prussia. Um, where a lot of the votes basically came from the from the elites and therefore that was still full of aristocrats yeah. um, and they could veto anything that came through the Reichstag so I think the, the system would probably have ground to a halt um, and they would have had to compromise one way or another because it, they they as a couple ran so against the zeitgeist at court in, in Berlin and in Prussia still at the time that I don't think that would have worked entirely. So even Frederick's uh, survival is not necessarily a panacea to the ills that uh, ills that followed. I don't um, think so. No, no I, I want to ask you a bit about Prussia as well. Um, I've seen, um, I think it was an interview that you gave when you, you sort of bemoaned the fact that Prussia tends to always get such a bad rep. Um, and I, it's something I entirely agree with because Prussia itself has a fascinating history. Mm. Um, and it's much more than its sort of cartoonish stereotype of, of militarism and, and authoritarianism and all of that. Um, but let me just ask you, you know, what what sort of happens to Prussia in that in that after 1871? Is it fair? You alluded to this in your opening presentation, but is it fair to say, does Prussia create Germany? Does Germany incorporate Prussia? Now, how does how does that dynamic between the two sort of play itself out between 18, 1871 and, 18, and 1918? I think it is largely as Bismarck had intended it to, you know, to basically make the rest of Germany an extension of Prussian power. That's still very much the case, simply because the entire state apparatus of Prussia becomes the state apparatus of Germany. So all of the civil servants initially are Prussian civil servants. Uh, they basically run all, everything behind the scenes, all the policy. Uh, you've got the Prussian king is always, that's that's part of the constitution, is always the German Kaiser, and there's no mm. way around that. So they don't kind of take turns and have the Bavarian King Ludwig, for example, as, as one of the you know Kaisers for a while or whatever. There's there's just no system there. Um, so there is there is that definitely. Um, and he wouldn't have been able to sell that to not least Wilhelm, you know, the, the Kaiser or the, the first German Kaiser as a concept, had that not been the case. And there was certainly a really strong uh, political field. Uh, hosting hosted by the Junkers as well by the Prussian landed aristocracy they were incredibly strong and incredibly strong lobby um, mostly sort of in, in what is now Poland like Pomerania and those sorts of areas there and they were constantly pushing their own things like for instance protectionism as, a, as an economic policy through because they wanted it not because it was something that suited all Germans um, Prussia also still had the majority just by default in the upper house of the of, of uh, the, the system um, in the Bundesrat, um, they had 17 uh, votes basically, you know, only needed, I think, 13 to, to have, a, um, have a veto so they could veto anything they didn't like. On the flip side, though, Bismarck is hugely conscious of the fact that this will fall apart if it becomes a Prussia-Germany completely mm. and if, this, if the other states don't go along with it, particularly the southern states like uh, Bavaria and, and Baden and Württemberg, where there are very, very strong local traditions, Catholicism being a, a kind of strong part of that. Um, and if he doesn't hold them, there's always kind of this, this idea that they'd either break away again or perhaps join forces with, with Austria in some uh, capacity. And he needed to be sure that that wouldn't happen. And so this federal system that he implements from the beginning gives so much power over to the individual states that it is a genuine federal 
you know, system whereby, so, so say Bavaria, for example, could have also, you know, vetoed things had the other states joined together, they could have uh, vetoed Prussian um, policy, for example. Mm. Um, the, the states also retain the right to dominate things like education, which is hugely important to people so that children can still get educated in the Catholic faith, for example. Um, and those sorts of things, Bismarck leaves to this day, actually, so education and stuff like that is still a federal matter, in, sorry, a, a state matter in Germany, so where the individual states make their own policy. Um, and I think that hybrid system worked to retain Prussian power and give the other states the feeling that they're still better off within this Prussian system than they are outside yeah. of it. Um, I have a, um, my, uh, maybe my last question, we'll see. Um, Depends how long it takes you to answer it. Um, I'm interested in the way in which the Second Empire, um, German Empire, 1871 onwards, is always uh, seen as a sort of, um, you know, the, the the origin of the baleful influence of what comes what comes later, the First World War, the collapse of the 1920s. Then you've got Nazism. Then you've got the Holocaust. And then, of course, the Cold War. It's almost as though the original sin is kind of committed in 1871. And I think this is something that's, it's it's there in the history, you can see it in the history books because it's very often mentioned in the quite, yeah. you know, almost in that sense, right? Um, but I think that's almost become a sort of part, you know, it, a part of the German psychosis about their own history, you know, for Gangenheit's Bewältigung and all of that stuff, this idea of coming to terms with the past. And I think it feeds into a sort of reticence to or reluctance to look at the empire on its own terms, yeah, on its own merits, right? right? No, so, so the question I want to ask you on the, on bearing that in mind is that where you, where you started this evening with your presentation, you talked about um, Frederick William III, his his proclamation and Mein Volk, where he talks about you know my people being Prussians, um, Lithuanians, uh, Poles. Uh, so it went on, right? Brandenburgers, and so it went on, and then almost a hundred, almost exactly a hundred years later. You go to 1918, the end of your story, and yeah, Germany's just been defeated and grievously defeated in the First World War. But apart from a few French hotheads, nobody's seriously saying that Germany should be destroyed and Germany doesn't deserve to exist, right? So in that hundred odd years, Germany has is become a reality, and it's become a reality in the in the hearts and minds of of countless millions of German people, crucially, which it wasn't necessarily in 19 uh, in 1813. So Let's turn that question or the implied question on its head, not to say what went wrong in the second in the second empire, but what went right? Um, well, I certainly set out to do exactly that in my book as well and try to, yeah. to set the record straight a little bit, because as you say, is there is this like, you know, idea, of, especially in Germany, that, that the original sin was committed then. Um, and if even if it was unintended, perhaps that's where it all began. Um, and yeah. that's, I think, also the reason why there were no commemorations this year of, of 150 years of Germany. Um, what went right, I think, was that the first German democracy was set up. And this is something that I feel quite strongly about because it's often just brushed aside. And then there's obviously the complete uh, hash of the Weimar democracy often presented as one that, is, that was doomed to fail. And then real German democracy uh, started in West Germany in, in 1949. Or for some people, even in 1989, with the with the reunification of Germany, um, but the parliament that is created by Bismarck is a genuinely modern and liberal thing um, that he sets up as a universally freely elected parliament, which is incredibly revolutionary for the time. And many many of his own people called him a traitor of his class, basically of, of his of his standing for introducing this into the constitution. So all men over the age of 25, regardless of social standing or uh, kind of wealth barriers could vote for this parliament and that parliament could block anything so if it, even if it comes from the kaiser or if it comes from bismarck the representatives of the people could sit there and say we're not doing this so the bigger question in 1914 is really why does this collapse why does that parliament abolish itself it didn't need to it wasn't forced by by uh, wilhelm it wasn't forced by the by the dictatorship that later sets in, uh, in during the war to, to abandon itself, it did that voluntarily. It signed an enabling act uh, in August um, 1914, which basically handed power over to the executive, which happens in many other countries as well. So you obviously get similar legislation in, in Britain and France as well to, to be able to you know, make quick decisions during the war. Um, but in Germany, there's somehow this, this thing whereby democracy still isn't quite trusted. 
uh, and every time there's a crisis they just abandon it basically and go oh let's just go back to to the more you know to the stability of a of a sort of system led from above and that's certainly my view on this so when when war breaks out in 1914 all germans including the socialists and the liberals who'd argued against the war suddenly sign up to this war um, and say, okay, if we if we are going to win this, then we do need to sign over, you know, basically self censor, sign over our freedoms, sign over our civil liberties, and all of those things to win the war. Uh, and nobody thinks twice of it. There aren't any demonstrations until the end of the war, uh, when it all begins to go wrong. Had they won it, I think, you know, basically, of course, they would have, you know, wanted something back for the war effort, the working classes, and concessions in terms of working hours and so on would would have to be made. But I'm not so sure that more democracy was on the cards at this point mm. because people were reasonably happy with the status quo as it was in, in 1914. So it isn't so much, I think, the problem in the way that it was set up. I think it's just that democracy hadn't matured for whatever reason in Germany as much as it had already done in, in say, Britain at this point because it was almost introduced from scratch in, in the middle of the, of the 19th century and didn't evolve over time because there was no centralized system beforehand. And I think that's the problem really. Um, that democracy kind of failed twice in 1914 and then again in 1933 um, and it, it took the really kind of strong post second world war regime under Adenauer to uh, give both the stability of kind of a, a top-led regime and the democracy at the same time for another two decades before Germans sort of slowly began to to trust in themselves and trust in a democratic democratic system. Uh, and what about that question of, you know, uh, it's always posed with, I think there was a, a, a book a long time ago called Peasants into Frenchmen, which sort of tracked this, you know, the development of the French, the, the French nation, as it were, mm -hmm. self-perception uh, in the 19th century. But you, you know, I was alluding to as well earlier on is that, as you can see that process in Germany as well, um, you know, creating Germans out of Bavarians and, well, questionable to what extent Bavarians still see themselves as Germans, but um, you know, out of Württembergers and and uh, and Rhinelanders and everyone else, and East Prussians, and so it goes on. That 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 is a, a remarkable um, development through the nineteenth century. Yeah, from, although you know, I think it's truly only cemented with the First World War. Okay. Many, peop many, many people see it as the sort of or catastrophe of German history because it does yeah. compound in the trauma it causes to everybody, regardless of station and, and locality and, and whatever else. Um, it causes the same trauma to everyone. And you can see that again after the Second World War as well, for instance, the fact that we now have the CDU party, Angela Merkel's party, as one confessional party for all German Christians. Um, that's a result of the Second World War. Previously, there were bitter, bitter fights between the Catholics and, and their, their centre party um, mm. and, and the Protestant parties who were seen to be aligned with, with Prussia. And that's something, again, that war changes. And I think the First World War is the first sort of, you know, or trauma at the beginning of, of kind of German nationhood, really, that compounds all of these things that were slowly going in that direction. Um, but it certainly makes everyone go through the same uh, pain and humiliation and everything else. And I think that's yeah. what compounded German nationhood. I think that's the reason why it doesn't fall apart in 1918. Wonderful. That's a, a perfect note on which to end our little um, discussion. Um, let's have a look at some of the questions from the floor, if I may, Katya. Yeah. I will. Um, uh, read some of these out. Uh, Anthony asks, a little, a little bit off topic, but I'm sure you'll manage. He says, uh, everyone knows about the displacement and migration of German speaking people after 1945, but was there a similar situation after 1918 with the border changes from the Treaty of Versailles? Um, well, people weren't forced out. So the, the really awkward bit about the 1919 arrangement in the Treaty of Versailles is that they had this desire obviously to create a Polish state. Um, so land was taken um, away from what was previously part of Germany and given to Poland, same, same with Russia on the other side, um, but felt because of the idea of self-determination, they couldn't take the kind of really overwhelmingly German areas away from Germany. And so they created this weird like, East, Prussia, uh, yeah, East Prussian sort of construct in the Baltic but that was separated from the bulk of Germany by what's sometimes called the Polish corridor. In, in that Polish corridor, you still had 3 million Germans living there, um, but they hadn't been forcefully displaced. And most of them were um, basically just farmers. So they had land uh, and large estates. And like I said, those Prussian Junkers, for example, were also still there. They weren't just gonna give those up. Um, and so most of them effectively stayed there rather than fleeing um, to Germany. 
And the situation is completely different after the Second World War because a decision is made that all of that land now goes to, um, was taken away from Germany, including East Prussia. Um, and then you have suddenly between 12 and 14 million Germans who are told that they can't stay there. So the, the phrase in the, in the Potsdam Agreement was to uh, have a humane process to uh, basically uh, get those people out of that region and, and, and displace them back into Germany, or not back into Germany, put them into Germany uh, proper, into the new borders. And then they have to leave. And of course, many of them see that as a much, much more uh, painful experience than the process after the First World War, where they may not, not be in Germany anymore, but they're still on their land, still in their same communities and, and just under a different state, basically. So the decision is slightly different in that sense. And of course, even the, the East Prussian uh, territory goes to uh, other countries at this point to, um, to try and basically un-Germanize the area. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next one, the mysteriously named GG uh ask us how many of the southern confederation states support prussia in the franco-prussian war 1870 and did any of them actively support france uh, they all rallied apart from austria um they all rallied to the cause so when when he called um or when the when the french basically declared war on uh, prussia uh, bismarck presents it as an all german thing they've, they've crossed the the mythical river rhine now you know and this this triggers all of these kind of war memories again from the beginning of the of the 19th century when they were fighting napoleon um so they all rally to the cause and and fight and this is also why bismarck sits there straight after and says now is the moment to make a german nation state we'll never have so much consensus again mm -hmm. uh, and my main argument in the book is basically that that's what plasters the german nation together is really french blood at this point um, because they defeated them all um, together. And it's that afterglow of nationalism, you know, everyone's still really kind of excited about the fact that they've just beaten the French um, very quickly and successfully as well. Um, and Bismarck uses that chance. And that's why he also has the ceremony to create Germany at Versailles in France. So it seems a bit of an odd choice to go into the heart of another nation to create your own. But he knew that if he'd done it, say, in Berlin, there's no way that Ludwig, the King of Bavaria, would have gone to Berlin to you know, hail the new sort of Prussian Kaiser as, as his Kaiser, that just wouldn't have happened. The, the, the humiliation of it, there's, there's no way they would have done that. So it had to be on you know, enemy territory basically to do that. But yes, they all, they all join, apart from Austria. Wonderful. A uh, couple, of, couple of questions that we kind of addressed. Mark Holland, great minds think alike uh, as mine. He asked about the uh, counterfactual of uh, um, Frederick III. Um, and Alan Lowe's was asking about um, Wilhelm's childhood and how that may be um, defined his future political, political career. Um, question for Katya from Paul Power. He says, did Bismarck make any preparations for his inevitable exit or replacement? I think it didn't really like occur to him that he'd have to go. He was just so um, confident and brash in the idea, like I said, that he created a system that nobody else could run. He knew that. Um, and because he had actually been on, on reasonable terms with Wilhelm when he was younger, he, for instance, got his own son, so Bismarck's son, Herbert, um, he got him to befriend Wilhelm, um, and they were very close buddies for a long time. So he just assumed, like he'd run the country for Wilhelm I, he was going to run the country for Wilhelm II, and it never occurred to him that this brash young Kaiser might have the audacity to just fire him, basically. And he only, even to the last minute, he still clings on to power. Um, so in, in 1890, just before he goes, three days before, he was still planning a coup, um, to try and basically curtail the powers of the of the Reichstag. So he still assumed then it would continue. And Wilhelm then basically has him rudely uh, woken up in the chancery, which is just a few doors down from the um, from the uh, palace and basically had him had him woken up and said he needs to come now. And poor old Bismarck had barely got out of his PJs basically and just walked over. Um, apparently still totally disheveled because he was deliberately woken up in the morning uh, and was told that he needs to go basically publicly as well as a huge humiliation to him. So I don't think he made any, so at least as far as I know, made any specific plans about what would happen um, once he was made to retire. I think he just imagined he, would gonna, he was going to continue until his yeah. death. Yeah, very good. Um, John Cobb asks about, um, asked if you can comment on the rise of socialism in, in Germany um through in, in the 1990s um and i suppose uh, just adding on to that um the sort of element of the development of state socialism in that sense as well that you know the development of the um of the, the welfare state as such as it was in germany but that's an important response can you say something about that 
Well, when I was at school, Bismarck was still credit credited with that. <laughs> so basically, we still learned about like the first German welfare state was created by Bismarck. That narrative has changed now a little bit, mm. but that's basically because he introduces things like accident insurance and mm. um, stuff like that, basically, where people for the first time, pensions as well, get some sort of sense of um, collective security basically where where everyone's looked after and Bismarck doesn't introduce that out of a sense of you know sort of humanitarian kindness um but it's very much an attempt to curtail socialism by a carrot and stick approach so he basically uh, bans the SPD the social democratic party uh, for some time where people have to go underground some people flee to Switzerland it's re later reinstated but that's one way in which he puts his foot down and says if you sort of can't behave yourself in parliament that's what's going to happen to you. And on the flip side, he introduces all of these social welfare uh, measures to try and appease workers. This is also something that continues. That's a legacy that continues after his death as well with the other German chancellors. Caprivi, his, his immediate successor, is very big on it. And then later Bülow, who's perhaps better known for his um, kind of place in the sun rhetoric and Germany needs an empire. But internally, domestically, he also continued with that. So Sunday work gets banned, for example, still is in Germany not banned outright, but basically very few people work on a Sunday. It's still, mm. a, it's still a bit of a bit of a holy day in Germany. You just haven't got shops open and things like that. And that all goes back to that, introduces the eight hour working day and those sorts of things. They're all very progressive ideas, which he does to uh, basically appease both the liberals and socialism. Um, but it is, it is more keeping a lid on things than actually dealing with the problem. So you see, when you look at the figures for SPD membership and also for the for the numbers of, of SPD members in Parliament, that it shoots up straight after 1890 after he goes because that lid's just lifted. Willem has got this idea he wants to be the Kaiser of the rebel as he as he phrased it, uh, quoting um, Frederick the Great uh, there. But his idea is that he'd be the Kaiser of the people and they must all love him. Uh, he's got a huge thing. It's a bit like some modern politicians, I guess, as well, in the sense that he needs to be loved and, and wants to be loved by his people. And so for a while, he continues with the social welfare um, things as well until he gets fed up because they don't work. And then he starts crushing strikes and things again as well. <laughs> um, a good question here, actually. The, the question is the European network, which sounds, sounds very grand. But the question is, how is the House of Hohenzollern perceived in modern Germany? I think that's quite an interesting angle mm. to pursue. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how far people are aware of this, but they're involved at the moment in a huge legal battle <coughs> over their estates. Um, so the current uh, Prince of Prussia, as he still styles himself, um, uh, Georg Friedrich, uh, is trying to get all of the Hohenzollern uh, properties and his estates reinstated to the family um, because a lot of them had been taken away after the Second World War. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting how emotional the response to that is. Um, it doesn't matter what legal arguments they bring forward. So in the legal situation, they basically have to prove that they didn't, their family didn't help the Nazis into power. And if they can prove that, then they can have their stuff back. So he's been trying for years, employing different historians. There's literally just a new book that's just come out about um, the Crown Prince Wilhelm, Wilhelm II's son and his role um, in, the, in the Nazi um, rise to power. Uh, but that's really completely besides the point because even the legal arguments that have been made in his favor, people just respond with such emotionality to the idea that th those Hohenzollerns will come back you know, and, and want power back in the, in the eyes of the people that you can still see how, how deep the resentment still is amongst yeah. uh, you know large swathes of the population and it is certainly something that is still very much on on people's minds um similarly with the first world war basically the role that Willem the second played um that debate has been shut down so many times i mean there are two major biographies of Willem the second and neither is written by a german yeah one one is basically rural who's a british historian um, with German origins, but yeah. British who worked in Britain, um, and the other is Clark, um, who Christopher Clark, who's Australian. So basically, you've got that situation still where they're a bit untouchable. I'd say yeah. in the in that in the sense that people don't really want to go there; that they they still have that lingering um, reputation. So I mean, related to that, I'll just jump in with a question of my own, if I may. But related to that, where where is German historiography at the moment with regard to the to the idea of the Sonderweg? This is the, the this is the sort of the uh, the special way that Germany had a particular uh, 
fate through the 19th century and, and the, the second second uh, empire is a crucial part of that Sonderweg, right and it's all about looking at history through the prism of nazism effectively mm. through through knowing what happened later on how, how catastrophic it was how do we explain that and many uh, generations of historians looked back at the second empire and saw that as part of the explanation where is german historiography on that point now well i would say certainly since the 1980s or so is that's been largely uh, replaced by other constructs. So the, the Zondervik on the whole is just seen as too simplistic and too too straight a path of history, basically yeah. going all the way over, over 200 years of history. Uh, Hedwig Richter, a German historian who's, who teaches at Munich, um, has recently also written a book about kind of the start of, of German modernity in the 19th century, re-evaluating like me a little bit the origins of German democracy in the 19th century but again the response has to that has been incredibly emotional because she actually works in Germany and then publishes in Germany um, and people have responded with such force to her arguments as well that you mm. know you still get the feeling that there's a sense of let's not go there we can't we can't re-evaluate the 19th century um, in that way because people see dangers for current political trends so her so she for instance is actually sort of center left in her political orientation writes a lot on, on politics as well uh, but has been the the uh, the reproach towards her has been oh you're playing into the hands of the of the modern you know far right at the moment who are trying to rewrite german history when actually all she's done is said you know there were some elements of modernity and liberalism in the 19th mm. century so there is that still um and then the other thing is that uh, because of uh, new movements like you know black lives matter and, and those sort of things that focus focus on colonial history Germany has also gone down that route a little bit in the sense that the German empire, such as it was, um, became more of a focus or has become more of a focus recently. Um, and that's sort of now seen as the dark side of 19th century um, yeah. German history. So we're not yet at uh, what we might call normalization with German history, are we? I certainly don't think so, no. no. Um, <laughs> look, very last yeah. question, very last question. This is from Declan Moran. He's uh, essentially asking you to put your journalist's hat on. He's saying, is there an analogy to be drawn between Bismarck's departure uh, and the and, and Angela Merkel leaving the stage of German politics today? Mm, only in the longevity of the chancellorship and the centrality of the office of the chancellor. I think that's always been a thing in the in various different German constitutions that there's one key strong focal point in the middle of it, and Angela Merkel is was that as well. Very much so, actually. People always portray her as a compromised politician and mm. she was that uh, but she was a ruthless political operator literally sidelining all of her political opponents um making sure that anybody who had any sort of spark to them were sort of quietened and, and just kind of sidelined and, and that's why we end up with this very kind of bland conservative party now in germany or with the, with the christian democrats um because like like bismarck i suppose there's another parallel there she had sort of managed to make herself the center of the system and everything went through her all the decision making processes and the other thing perhaps is that germany still looks very much towards russia and the west and tries to bridge that gap with varying degrees of of success as i've bemoaned in in my articles uh quite a lot as well but yeah. this idea that germany still is a central european power rather than a western european power uh, is something that that merkel has also perpetuated i think but that's mm. probably where the similarities end Wonderful. Excellent. Um, Katya, that was fantastic. That was um, insightful, inspirational, all sorts of words uh, like that are springing to mind. Thank you very much for your expertise. Um, thank you, of course, also for the book. I heartily recommend it. Um, it's a brisk read. It's not a, not a massively fat book. It's one you can read in a couple of sittings um, and it's beautifully written. Very nice, concise history of the, of the Second Empire absolutely heartily recommend it um thank you Katya thank you all of you for listening um and I apologize apologies to those who whose questions I didn't get round to I do apologize but I think we get we gave this subject a good runabout so uh thank you all of you thank you Katya thank you very much Roger well uh thank you very much uh, everybody uh, I thought that was fantastic really really enjoyed it